we, we have more members coming, but they, uh, we, we have a few other things happening around the building, and so uh, we'll, we'll be seeing people come in and out. Uh, you may all know by now that there was a water leak in room 10, and that's why we had our, uh, hopefully all the speakers <coughs> all, uh, have, have found our, our room here. Um, this is a, as you recall my uh, introductory uh, remarks from uh, the last meeting, there were several issues that we had wanted to get to last year, and we simply ran out of time. There was, um, there was so much to cover in overview, and then we had to start going on bills to meet uh, committee deadlines. And so this is another of those where we look at the intersection of um, mental health and housing and homeless uh, issues. And uh, last uh, week I credited Micah with he this hearing. Uh, today I will credit Mindy Greiling for this hearing because uh, as a a former member, uh, she has educated me uh, on, in a huge way on this particular issue. And what you should know about um, uh, Mindy Greiling is she has written a memoir, which is going to be published by the University of Minnesota, I think, later this year. So we can all watch for it, and we expect she'll be out on the speaking circuit after, uh, after <laughs> that happens. <laughs> so you're going to be hearing from a number of people uh, about this particular issue, uh, the intersection of those issues. The one, uh, there are a number of, of uh, handouts, I think every speaker has a handout in your packet, but one um, extra one that we put in that I wanted to call your attention to is um, the uh, uh, article about Finland, that they have managed to ensure that there are almost no homeless people. Um, the numbers are going down there. Um, those affected receive, without prerequisite, a small apartment and advice and then they can get on with building their lives. Four out, of five people, four out of five affected people create the path to a stable life. As we always know, uh, nothing else in life goes well if you don't have a safe place to sleep at night. And so um, Finland has, has added that to their commitments. And uh, now that Representative Juergens is here, uh, the question I have for him, because he took part in the housing count uh, last week, and so I'm checking with him whether he has anything to report. A little bit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry I'm late. I was went to the wrong room initially. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I did participate in the uh, uh, point in time homeless count with Dakota County with their outreach people. Preliminary numbers um, show that Dakota County is about the same as last year, which uh, was around probably 75 uh, overall countywide. Um, the if there were any trends and again this is all preliminary they're going to um, send me a report when they have it all compiled the the one thing that was interesting is, is a, a slight increase in um more in in older homeless people um over age 65 or 75 and in the a couple at least a couple of cases it was where one um you know a spouse got put into a, a senior living the other person didn't need senior living, but then that left them literally out in the cold. So that's something that, that we'll, we might have to take a, a closer look at, some of the reasons why. But, but overall, um, numbers seem to be about the same as they were last year. Thanks for taking part in that. Thank you. So we have a very full agenda. We'll just uh, move right in with um, uh, Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless, Rhonda Ot Otteson, and let me know if I pronounced that correctly. And, and that, uh, this presentation has three handouts in your packet. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Rhonda Otteson, Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to share testimony today. The Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless is a statewide advocacy organization that works to generate policies, community support, and local resources for housing and services to end homelessness in Minnesota. Since 1984, MCH has partnered with organizations, communities, and people with lived experience of homelessness toward our mission. MCH's knowledge and experience is deeply rooted in the issues of homelessness and housing instability. Today, I am bringing forth a high-level view of key research, as well as insights we've gathered through our work across the state to strengthen the homeless response system and prevent homelessness from occurring. 
I'll also include three key priorities that provide real solutions that address housing instability and also contribute to the well-being of people with mental health issues. First, I'll share some key data points from the 2018 Wild Earth Study. This triennial study provides in-depth research about homelessness. In your packet of information, I've included for your ref this for your reference. Here are some key data points that I'd like to call your attention to as it relates to our discussion here today. The first data point is the 2018 wild, in the Wilder Homeless Study I'd like to discuss is the number of people experiencing homelessness. On this single night in October 2018, 10,233 people were homeless. This is divided into two groups, so children and adults that are sheltered and children and adults that are unsheltered. Unsheltered homelessness includes living outside, other places not meant for human for habitation, such as a vehicle or tent. Can you switch microphones? Because apparently that microphone's not working. Sorry. Just move to the other chair. Okay. I think that will work. How's that? Okay. So going back to sheltered versus unsheltered. Um, Sheltered homeless situations include staying in emergency shelters and doubling up, which may seem more safe. However, while doubling up is, a warm, is warmer during the colder months of the winter, doubling up can create serious vulnerabilities, especially for youth. People in these situations may trade sex for shelter or become victims of sexual assault or trafficking. Doubling up is not a safe or sustainable solution. Here are some other key statistics of the most recent Wilder study. Overall, the number of people experiencing homelessness is up 10% from 2015. Homeless children and youth aged 24 and younger are similar um, in levels counted in 2015. Together, they rep represent nearly half of the homeless population. One bright spot is that families experiencing homelessness decreased by 5%. Homeless adults increased from 2015 particularly among those 55 and older, where the increase was up 25%, which you mentioned earlier. People not in formal shelter outside or temporarily doubled up increased 62% over the 2015 study. This is very alarming. People of color and Native Americans are grossly overrepresented in the homeless population. Minnesota continues to see some of the greatest racial disparities in the country and homelessness is no exception. The, great disparity, the greatest disparities are seen in two key statistics. First, Native Americans comprise 1% of Minnesota's pop, general population, but are 12% of the homeless population. And second, black or African American households comprise 5% of Minnesota's general population, but are 37% of the homeless population. To round out this kind of dig into the uh, statistics about homelessness, I want to share another key data point that highlights a largely unseen potential for a wave of homelessness that, um, that is consistently looming. And that is according to the Minnesota Housing Partnership. About one in four renters in Minnesota are at risk of homelessness because they are paying a disproportionate amount of their income towards rent. They, that is the greatest risk factor to become, becoming homeless. So um, after that quick overview of homelessness in Minnesota, I want to move more specifically into the area of mental health. Homelessness, housing instability, and the deterioration of mental health are intertwined. People with mental health issues are more likely to be homeless. And conversely, when somebody is experiencing the stress of homelessness, their mental health erodes. I want to call your attention to the handout in your packet that looks a lot like this, with two key statistics on it. In the general population, one in four people um, have a diagnosed mental health issue. According to the Wilder Report, 64% of youth and adults experiencing homelessness had a diagnosed mental health issue making it two to three times more likely among people experiencing homelessness. So studies show that housing models with a low barrier approach like the housing first philosophy or harm reduction models where the focus is to get people with serious mental health challenges into housing with fewer rules and restrictions 
is an effective first step in addressing mental health and addiction. Because there is a great list of folks here that are testifying after me um, with substantial knowledge and expertise in the mental health field, I'm going to segue into some solutions that will more effectively address the needs of people with mental health and other disabilities at the local level across Minnesota. We know that there isn't one kind of housing that fits the needs of every Minnesotan. From a veteran experiencing homelessness, to a first time home buyer, to a young person transitioning out of foster care, to our aging senior population, we must address the needs along the full continuum of housing. Minnesota Housing estimates that we are currently 53,000 units of housing short in Minnesota to address the needs of all people, 53,000. For, for people facing housing instability and having limited financial resources, available and affordable housing is extremely difficult to come by. People are actively searching for a place and it is taking months to secure a safe and decent place to live. Adding in the challenges of depression, anxiety, and other me mental health needs makes finding housing a heavy lift. In 2018 and 2019, MCH listened to homeless shelter providers, their staff, and people with experience in the shelter system to learn more about the challenges, barriers, and solutions to strength strengthening the statewide emergency shelter response system. Across the state, there is a lack of shelter capacity or no shelter at all. I want to call your attention to the small booklet in your packet, which is less, it's this, but bigger. Um, this is the result of, of those tours. You'll find key statistics and quotes from providers and people staying in shelters demonstrating the critical needs across the state. On the back of the last page, you'll see the different locations across the state that inform this work and help to shape solutions I'll present next. This year, MCH has three priorities that will align with the needs of Minnesotans experiencing homelessness and struggling with mental health issues. These priorities include expanding emergency shelter beds to ensure no one has to sleep outside, investing in programs that cultivate long-term stability, and guaranteeing everyone in Minnesota has a permanent place to call home. The first priority is expanding and preserving emergency shelter beds. Currently, 63 of 87 counties in Minnesota lack a fixed site shelter. 63 of 87 counties. Expanding emergency shelter beds will provide immediate and temporary housing for our most vulnerable Minnesotans. As we listen to shelter providers and shelter residents, we learned some key insights. They included that the physical space of short-term emergency shelter needs to be appropriately appropriate to support people with mental health challenges. Shelters need resources, so they are able to create options for private rooms. Smaller scale shelters are especially needed in communities without a shelter. Bringing people inside means that shelter staff are able to assist adults to find and keep employment, get connected to vital community resources, all while working toward affordable and safe housing. We need to make it possible for shelters to build or rehabilitate spaces that are safe and healthy so individuals can work on their goals for stability, including mental wellness. Investing in resources to expand emergency shelters will make improvements to Minnesota's rental and housing markets while sustaining a healthy and prosperous community. Our second priority is to strengthen the emergency services program. The emergency, emergency shelters are the starting point to gaining long-term stability. The Emergency Services Program is a flexible fund that can support emergency shelters, street outreach, drop-in or day shelters, and motel vouchers across the state. Short-term emergency housing needs, or housing needs to be adequately funded so individuals and families can move into their permanent place to call home. Our third priority is to invest in housing along the continuum through a robust bonding bill. We know that the solution to homelessness includes every type of home, from rental housing with support services to affordable home ownership opportunities, a home provides a platform for success and helps to build wealth. We desperately need significant investments in housing options for children, families, adults, veterans, seniors that are safe and affordable. A multifaceted approach to addressing the housing crisis is essential for saving lives 
and ending homelessness. Furthermore, tailoring our shelter system to meet the needs of all people is essential. This includes people with mental health needs, people with physical disabilities, people with brain injuries, and culturally specific services. I'm just going to wrap up with one final thought. Every Minnesotan should have a dignified place to call home. As we move into the legislative session, MCH is committed to expanding and improving our emergency shelters to create a safe and decent place to sleep and ensure investments and bonds for homes so Minnesota is a place with healthy communities and strong economies. Thank you very much. And members, I won't particularly invite questions after every speaker, but uh, we'll be watching for hands should you uh, have some. Oh, Representative Jurgens. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and I have a question for you based on, on some of your testimony, but if you'd rather defer to some of the other people later on, that's good too. But with the, with, you know, mental health is, mo is difficult enough to deal with if you have a perfect home situation, and addiction is difficult if you have a perfect home situation and and as you talked about that's one of the challenges with many of the people that are homeless is that they're suffering from one or the other or both um, one suggestion that I've heard and I just want to get your thoughts on this is to find a way to to initially treat some of the the individuals while they're still in the field um, you mentioned uh, housing that is um, maybe more lenient with with some of those things but have you given any thought or are there ways to to begin the counseling uh, process with people when they're still unsheltered uh, Ms. Otteson Madam am I Chair. pronouncing it correctly uh, yes yes ma thank you um, representative Jurgens, madam chair um, members of the committee um, I would probably defer to some of the mental health providers um, on whether that would be an effective way um, I think when you're in a homeless situation, the stress of that um, can make it really difficult to, to take on some of those um, steps to really increase that mental wellness um, when you're worried if you have food or how you're going to walk to the shelter or if you it's so cold out, you're worrying about your life. So um, we could um, certainly look and see if there are some providers that could provide some more insight for you on that. If you'd like and so uh, we'll just invite uh, future speakers if they have heard that question. Represent, Represent Bierman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to, to address that point, I think um, it seems to me from what I've been reading and hearing and the folks I've talked to is that that stability of a place is so fundamental. And the other point is, is that if someone is not stable in a place, how do you deliver the services to them where they are and then when they're not there because they are so transitory during the daytime so it makes that connection much harder but having said that there may be individual case cases where that has been effective with some people I'm sure uh, so this whole housing situation is such that it's as different as the, you know, people are homeless for so many different reasons that it, it, you really have to treat the individual. So it's a matter of finding what works for them and what treatment they need. But I think this, what we're all talking about, a place and then a connection with people to get them stable and then rest because it's exhausting the lives they've been living, being homeless, and then finally getting onto a long-term path of, of life-sustaining uh, abilities to care for themselves and and be productive. Representative Fisher. Uh, thank you. I can give a couple of quick things. I know that in uh, the homeless youth world, there's been some work in that area. I know that Safe Zone in downtown St. Paul, which is a drop-in center, does provide mental health services through there. I also know that there was some funding that came through the state last year. Some new grants just came out from MDH, and that they're moving uh, in the youth world. They're putting in mental health counselors that are going directly into the shelters where they're getting support and pay to be in there because in the past it's been trying to figure out how do these organizations afford to hire these people in to do it. And so the state's put in some extra money where they uh, have those resources starting to happen. Those grants are just starting to roll out and were just awarded within the past month. Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I just want to highlight that I used to, in my previous life, I used to be a social worker working with um, adults who are struggling with mental health, chemical health, and are homeless. And one of the biggest challenges wa was not addressing the mental health or the chemical health. The biggest challenge was 
if the person is homeless or unhoused, how do you get hold of them? You can provide all the services that you, you, you want, but you won't. If you find them today, you can't find them tomorrow. And if somebody doesn't know where they're going to be tomorrow, how do you schedule appointments for them, whether it's doctor's appointment, whether it's counseling, um, even for jobs, if they have a job interview, how do you get hold of them? So that stabilization is the key here. If a person doesn't have it, it goes back to uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need. You need food and shelter more than anything else. So if we can't, if somehow we can't stabilize these this individuals' lives, providing services will be really hard. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And we have uh, Mr. Spiker from the Catholic Charities. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm John Speaker with Catholic Charities. Oh, I'm Charities. sorry. Mis mispronounced that? It's an easy <laughs> uh, mistake to make. Um, so I'm the director of um, client services for Catholic Charities um, and for St. Paul in Minneapolis. I oversee the development uh, and delivery of client services addressing issues of health and housing instability in Catholic Charities housing services located both in Ramsey and Hennepin counties. Catholic Charities served over 23,000 children, families, and adults over the course of 2019. We provided over 1.2 million meals and nearly 600,000 nights of supportive housing and emergency shelter. Um, over the last two fiscal years, we've experienced a 32% increase in clients seeking housing services, including emergency shelter and permanent housing. Uh, we have also seen a significant increase in older adults seeking services. Today, one in three of our clients is over the age of 55. Uh, so we are truly on the front lines of significant increases in homelessness in trying to address those needs. Um, I want to take this, I want to thank you for this opportunity today to talk about housing and homelessness and mental health. I want to start by stating that mental health is not a cause of homelessness. Lack of housing stock that is affordable is the cause of homelessness. Uh, lack of affordable housing adversely affects those with mental health issues in multiple ways. For example, if a person is receiving hospital level care for mental health needs, just creating a discharge plan to leave the hospital is a significant barrier because it's complicated by the housing shortage of where someone can go. So hospitals back up with keeping people in beds the whole system gets bogged down because there's no place for people to go. <clears throat> a second example is, <clears throat> excuse me, housing funding often requires residency to maintain that housing. So any kind of inpatient treatment often causes people to become unhoused again. So people are reluctant to go to treatment because they don't want to give up their housing. And it creates a whole other path of instability to pursue health care versus um, get, keeping your basic needs intact. All of us have experienced complex decision making in our lives, like buying a car to help us get to, to maintain our lives, to get to a job, pick up the kids, etc. Um, or picking a school district or a neighborhood that is a, right for our family, our children. Um, so we can easily imagine and appreciate how much harder it is when someone is lacking basic needs like housing while they're also dealing with severe chronic health issues. And that's what mental health is, is a, fear, a severe chronic health issue. As we have all experienced those, different, uh, those difficult periods in our lives, we know that in, the, in these situations, it is often our family or social supports that help us get through those experiences. For homeless persons in communities who experience mental health, that's lacking, and it starts with housing. I'd like to share a brief story of an individual that is part of our shelter system currently. Um, Jesse is, a, that, and it kind of talks about some of the basic challenges that an individual experiences. Jesse is a parent, mid-40s, uh, living in our shelter. Um, and as we got to know Jesse, we understand that uh, Jesse has experienced all 10 of the adverse childhood experiences um, on that scorecard. It's a 10 out of 10 scale. It speaks about the, uh, how adverse childhood experiences affect someone's long-term health um, and it, uh, it impacts their lives, you know, kind of for the rest of their lives. 
that includes violence between parents. It includes parents care or a caregiver getting incarcerated. It includes experiencing sexual abuse. It includes that you that the individual feels that their life is in danger at some point. Jesse experienced all 10 of those uh, scores. Um, Jesse sought help from our staff to find housing after living in our shelter for about six months. We don't have staff generally to help people move out of shelter. Our staff at shelter are to keep people safely sheltered. And um, currently we have about 350 people in our shelter every night in St. Paul. So they don't, they don't have the skills or the capacities to help people navigate out of shelter. We're trying to keep them safe in the moment. So Jesse took some initiative. Uh, Jesse presents as confused and a frequent user of alcohol and other substances. Um, and so um, because of that presentation, that led us to try to help him, uh, help Jesse get a recommendation for a diagnostic assessment completed. Because Jesse is a poor historian, Jesse has been uh, unstable for a long time. He can't, Jesse could not really describe all of the, uh, the life experiences. So, um, but Jesse had a sibling who could help fill in that gap. You can't really do a good diagnostic assessment without that historical perspective. You can't really synthesize what's happening in that brain to help that individual determine what's their current challenges and then what are the treatment uh, options in front of them. So that history is really, really important. A homeless person usually does not have ho uh, family supports and it's very, very difficult to find those records from healthcare facilities because they are disenfranchised. They have lost all of those connections. Uh, because Jesse had a sibling, um, Oh, by the way, we see about 90% of the DAs that we do at Catholic Charities are without those kinds of social supports or family supports. So we're relying on that individual to tell us what uh, is happening. Because Jesse had a sibling, we were able to identify that Jesse had brain trauma as a child. Uh, Jesse had a lifelong learning disability and that he had always struggled with social interactions and educational experiences. Um, we also learned that Jesse was housed by that same sibling um, until Jesse's behaviors became so violent and the, that housing, that sibling, as well as the minor children in the house felt unsafe is when that sibling contacted the police and Jesse was removed from that uh, house. Um, that's how Jesse got to the shelter. Uh, that sibling, though, again, to Jesse's um, benefit, continued to be a rep payee and helps Jesse manage the um, social security benefits that Jesse receives. So that's a great act of um, compassion and love on the part of that sibling, but it's also a source of conflict because when Jesse wants access to funds at different points of the month, that sibling is having to set boundaries um, in this adult relationship and it creates a lot of conflict. Jesse is also resilient though because um, Jesse had a parent, his mother, that supported Jesse until, Jesse, until she died. Um, it was that death that really kind of caused Jesse's uh, life to kind of start going downward again, or, go, or going downward more significantly. Uh, Jesse's mom believed Jesse when Jesse reported sexual abuse as a child. That was a really significant event. Um, a lot of data supports that one caregiver can make a significant difference in someone's life. I think this is an example of that. But when that support was removed due to natural causes, uh, that has a significant impact on then the, the life of the individual. Jesse is currently asking for case management and armed services as a strategies to help Jesse find housing. Um, you have to have a good diagnostic assessment to be able to qualify for case management services and or armed services. So you will see the barrier there again of how to access the services that exist for the homeless population. So despite all of these challenges, um, Jesse continues to go forward with hope. He acts in hope um, and works to make things better. I think that's the other point that I would really like to emphasize. All humans are striving to, for a better future and it's our natural impulse and very often it's our systems that prevent that um, from occurring. So in conclusion, 
um, I would just like to leave a, uh, say a couple points. We can effectively address and solve these issues. Affordable housing systems can improve at providing housing stability for people with mental health issues. Housing first practices can include the needed supports for people with mental health challenges that promote health and maintain housing. Housing providers can expect financial outcomes in timeframes that are realistic for both the owner and the tenant that recognizes health as a component. State policies and housing developer practices can be created to fund both housing and mental health supports at the same time. It should never be an either or. And finally, no one chooses to experience mental health diseases, just as making the choice of where to live is not a choice when housing does not exist. People will choose health and housing stability if given real choices. Our current health and housing systems do not provide those choices in rural or urban Minnesota. I want to thank you again for this opportunity to speak today, and I will be here if you have any further, further questions. Thank you for your testimony. Absolutely. And we next have Lee Stewart from Churches United in Ministry, which is a Duluth uh, program. Thank you for coming down today. Please well, identify. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Please, please Chairman. identify yourself for the record. Yeah. My name is Lee Stewart. I'm the executive director of CHUM in Duluth. Uh, I have a handout. I'm just going to speak from it, but you don't need to refer to it if you don't want to. Basically, CHUM is a group of 43 congregations that since 1973 has been one of the primary safety net organizations in the city of Duluth. Uh, we have two constituencies. One are the members of those congregations, and they are fiercely loyal to us and very much wanting to us to fulfill our mission of providing basic needs, fostering stable lives, and organizing for a just and compassionate community. And those folks contributed 22,000 hours of volunteer service last year. Uh, our other constituency are about the 8,000 people who come every year to one of CHUM's programs. We have emergency shelter, food shelves, street outreach, winter warming centers, a 24-hour drop-in center, uh, families at the Steve O'Neill Apartments, and uh, most recently a respite house that we operate in conjunction with Loaves and Fishes for a discharge plan for people who are uh, experiencing homelessness when they're discharged from the hospital and would benefit from home care but don't have a home. We're testing that. So 8,000 people there were much smaller than Catholic Charities, but that, I wanted to give you a sense of the scale. Every year at CHUM we have about 1,000 to 1,200 people who come to the emergency shelter. Fewer than one-third of them are homeless for the first time. That's a big difference than when I first came to CHUM in 2013. When I first came, there were more, it was almost half were homeless for the first time. Now, uh, less than a third. Uh, and 30 percent are chronically homeless, means that they've been homeless for the long term, over a year, four times in the last three years, and have a disability. Uh, we've been averaging 87 people a night in our shelter, uh, plus another 40 in the remote warming centers when they're open, so 120 plus. Uh, that's also a big increase in the, since I've been at CHUM, when 40 at CHUM would have been an, a big night. Uh, now 87 is about what we're seeing. Again, to re echo this, 45% uh, of the people who come to CHUM are from communities of color, grossly overrepresented over in the homeless uh, population. 61% uh, have a disability, uh, and that's a 10-year average, and 55% of the people who come to CHUM report a mental health issue when they come in through the door. So, it's, so our job, basically, if you just think of the people who are experiencing mental illness, is finding 500 places for people to live, 500 people a place to live during the course of a year. And they're just, we haven't built a single unit for a single individual since I've been in Duluth. And we, uh, the, so the issue is that we have an absolute shortage of affordable housing uh, across the city that we estimate a 3% vacancy rate, but so for so-called affordable project, it's about a 0.4% uh, vacancy rate. So we don't, have en we don't have enough apartments for people. And they're not the right kind of apartments. Uh, studios and efficiency apartments are the thing that's most needed. 78% of the people who are at CHUM are single individuals. Uh, I applaud everything we do for families. We also work with families, but we're really missing the lo single largest group of people that we work with are single individuals, and the, the units that, that would be most appropriate for them are simply not available and are not in the pipeline. They're expensive. 
uh, $576 now, for, and I know this may not be, seem expensive for Twin Cities, but for us it is. Studio, 961 for a one bedroom, and since they're only building one bedroom apartments, or the new bed all coming online, there are almost $1,000 a month that need to be subsidized somehow, which is very difficult. So it, this is sort of the dirty truth about it. For individuals in Duluth, because we're, we don't have uh, new units coming on board, they pretty much have to go into the private market or to the board and lodge system. And it is really, it's a landlord's market right now. It's an owner's market. And on a, a good day, someone coming out of CHUM most likely will have three strikes of stigma against them. They're on rental assistance, they're homeless, they're a person of color, and they're mentally ill. Many will have four, but at, you know, maybe three. Uh, and so those, it's really easy for landlords to deny admission to uh, people who are, they perceive as problem tenants. And all of those things in a uh, market like Duluth are seen as a problem. And they don't need to take you, and they won't. So that, that's a huge, huge, huge challenge for us. In our work with families, we're also the service provider at the Steve O'Neill Apartments, which are permanent supportive housing for uh, 44 families with children who have experienced either long-term or recurrent homelessness. And our mission there is to break the cycle of family homelessness by providing really great uh, support services for families and children that, uh, with a special focus on the children. So we have licensed child care, we have after school programs, really trying to give those children the, the support that they need not to go around while, again, while supporting their parents as well. Um, the folks who say there are 91% of them have been long-term homeless and 73% and identify a long-term disability and 80% have had domestic violence. So these are very much what people are considered like the hardest to house. It's like uh, Jesse, the person you just heard about. The families are facing the same kind of issues of shortage of units, but at least there's some permanent supportive housing and transitional housing that is specifically focused for fa uh, families experiencing homelessness. Uh, one of the biggest challenges for, for those families is that the process to get into any one of those units is extraordinarily difficult and very, very, very long. Uh, along with everyone across the country, we operate in the coordinated entry system. And so the steps are people need an assessment. Not, they call 911. They say that they're homeless. It takes a while to get an assessment. We give them, a, they have a score that talks about how vulnerable they are to housing and homelessness and what steps, how hard it's going to be for them to get back into housing. Uh, your typical wait in the, across the state is four to six months after you have that assessment before you're referred to a housing project or a housing program. And then another five months to go through a background check, a rental history, proof of homelessness, proof of disability, proof of income to satisfy the owners of those buildings and particularly the low-income housing tax credit requirements. Once you get through that, you need another four or five months to get through all the compliance checks if the project is associated with something like a housing authority. Uh, so if, it, and if at any time during that course of the time you happen to get a job, you have to start all over because your income changes. And uh, that's just, we, we've had people who've been in the process 18 months. Uh, I have made a table of the coordinated entry times across the state of Minnesota and through in St. Louis County. Uh, this is from ICA, which is our manager of uh, the homeless management information system. And the average time it takes across the state for someone with a high barrier score is 439 and a half days between the time they have that assessment and they move in. Uh, for St. Louis County, we're worse, 495 days. So can you imagine yourself as a person who experiences frequent or even infrequent mental health crises trying to last 495 days through this entire process of at least five meetings, maybe eight meetings, maybe 10 meetings uh, over the course of the year when it's hard to find you, you don't have a phone, you've lost, you know, you're, you, where are you living, who is where, and, and, we, and we're pretty connected and it's difficult for us. You have to collect over 80 pages of documentation to get into one of these apartments, into the Steve O'Neill apartments. Much harder to get in than to get a mortgage. Uh, you have to prove over and over, at each, each time you do it, re-traumatizing. Are you poor enough? Are you hungry enough? Are you homeless enough? Are you disabled enough? Oh, you made too much money. You, you didn't report your plasma income? You've got to start all over. That's fraud. We've actually had the HRA claim fraud against the family because they forgot to mention the income that they got from donating plasma as part of their monthly income. And that person had to start all over for another six months. So, I don't know, I couldn't manage it for 495 days and, I'm not, and it's just much more complicated. So then once people move in, those issues persist. We build housing for the hardest to house, but the hurdles to get in are against that. 
Uh, people have a difficult time maintaining the lease. They have a difficult time with a, a residence. The services are all are, are voluntary. People, so there's no you can't force anybody to participate in services. Uh, and people often refuse the assistance or fire their mental health worker. That's not the best decision maybe for them, but they have the right to make that decision, but it sends them on a path which is very, very difficult and there's no way right now for us to help uh, to deal with that. Recurrent mental health hospitalizations also impact whether they can stay in the housing or not. And you have a lack of impulse control and being on survival for so long, that doesn't make for uh, stability. It's not, it's, it's not, it's very difficult. So there's, for me, it's always a tension between people have a right to self-determination, but when, the, and, and no one is choosing, but they might not have a chooser that, in, in an environment that can even make a free choice. And so how do you really, so there's someone at Chum Shelter right now who doesn't have, he's, he never makes the grade for being able for hospitalization for medical or mental health reasons, but he walks around the shelter naked, he steals from people, he is incontinent, he's in, you know, we don't have the ability to take care of him, but people say he's making his own choices, it's okay. It's not okay, that's against human dignity. And it's really, but, so he has multiple, multiple barriers, and you know, we're doing the best we can, but it's not what he needs. So what we really do need, um, is something that goes beyond a crisis response. The, the, health, the Housing Services for Adults with Serious Mental Illness, which was a grant that came from the DHS a couple of years ago through HDC and then to CHUM has been really helpful because that gets uh, uh, people accelerated access to diagnostics when they're ready for that, gets a treatment when they're ready for that, uh, so it can provide more mental health services both in the shelter and uh, in housing when the people are ready for that. Uh, but that's, that's a great kind of start and I'd like to see that, that, that program expanded. We need places for long-term consistent care. We need to support long-term mental health uh, uh, supports in supportive housing. Uh, Minnesota does a good job of building uh, bricks and mortar, but the, supplying the services for the permanent supportive housing, that's 100% on us as a philanthropic organization right now. And so something about that would be useful. Um, uh, and one thing we found to be the most effective kind of surprising is that we need to be an ad, we need to protect the landlords, the landlords who are willing to house people who are very, very difficult to help them when those folks begin to have problems. So we, our outreach worker works a lot with landlords to say, okay, I'll help you get over that, you know, because you want to keep the person housed. We know they shouldn't have 10 people sleeping there. We'll help you not have 10 people sleeping there. So building kind of a fund and protection for the landlords and support for landlords uh, to make sure that they can help ch keep deciding to use their housing for people with the greatest barriers. Um, so that's in a nutshell, and I see you signaling, so. Thank you, yep. no, thank you, Dr. Stewart. Yep. Yep. A, uh, a representative Hornstein. Um, thank you so much, um, Ms. Stewart, and I, I really appreciate your mention of the Steve O'Neill apartments. Mm -hmm. um, Steve O'Neill was my mentor and very, yep. very close Great, friend. Uh, yep. And, be happy. you know, so anytime I hear his name, I, I'm, Dad and uh, we, we miss him so much. But um, and I was at the dedication. Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm just curious. Um, is this? And it's a great model. And um, h how common is this around the state? I know I've seen this. You know, we have the bridge and the district I represent that is a little mm -hmm. like that. You know, with regard to youth homelessness. But h how many Steve O'Neill type apartments are there around the state? And is this a model that is? Of being adopted and funded. I really don't know. Lee Blonde can help you with some of those models there. I, I that think that Lee is another Steve O'Neill. There, there are a number. There are lots of them that are something or other like that. I mean, and and the idea of permanent supportive housing for families it has been and continues to be a high priority in Minnesota. Uh, we did have a funding. Uh, the tax syndicator came to us for. A, uh, she's new on the and wanted to examine the portfolio and said she had never been in a place that had as many supports as Steve O'Neill Apartments had. Yeah. Now, that it was much heavier. It cost us about half a million dollars to make that happen. We have 10 people who work there with uh, early childhood after school and, and family coaching. And the, the best statistic, though, that we're doing the work is that there are 37 children who live there now who are under the age of five, and 22 of them were either born there or less than one when they moved in. So I got some hope for those guys. So it sounds like a future speaker yeah. might be able to uh, yeah, and, The and, scope of it, yeah. And Madam Chair, if anyone's in around Duluth, I would encourage folks to, to visit. Yeah, we, we think it's pretty special. We're not, everyone says we're the only one. I never think we're the only one, but uh, anything else? Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you.
and now we have oh we now now we have now, Lee Blondes and <laughs> this is <laughs> Lee Blondes and, and John expert. Fritz <laughs> from Beacon and I will tell you uh, just this morning I told uh, several of the Beacon stories again we we have partnerships with some nonprofits that uh, that that inform us a great deal and we continue to use them as examples so thank you for being here thank you, thank you chair thank you uh, committee members uh, I am Lee Blondes I'm the CEO and president of Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative uh, and John Fritz is here with me he'll speak as well um, uh, Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative is a collaborative of a hundred congregations here in the Twin Cities uh, we provide emergency shelter for families uh, we uh, own and develop uh, deeply affordable housing, including supportive housing, focusing on those most in need, um, as well as uh, doing our public policy advocacy work as well. We have developed almost 600 homes in 18 apartment buildings here in the Twin Cities. I'm really uh, pleased to have this opportunity to talk about the intersection of housing and mental illness and poverty. I think it is important to really lift up that part of poverty that is integral to the conversation that we're having because I think it's easy sometimes to other people who may have a mental health diagnosis and I'm guessing there's many of us in our room that may fall into that or in within our families and that what is so tragic in these circumstances is the lack of a home or the resources to access uh, ongoing treatment so often we're talking about people with untreated mental illness and so just to, to name that as we begin the conversation I want to share a little bit more about supportive housing and its effectiveness. Uh, John Fritz, who is a former tenant, will talk about the impact that supportive housing had in his life. And then I will close with a couple of comments about the policy solutions that have uh, made our work possible and some of the gaps that we currently see in the system. I just could not stress more how much we and the general community that works in the homelessness believes that supportive housing is the long-term solution to ending homelessness. Uh, we know it works, and it's really about taking it to scale. Supportive housing, in simple terms, is a deeply affordable apartment with intensive, comprehensive services, uh, like Lee Stewart was talking about, that provide those wraparound services uh, to help people stabilize their lives and can really end homelessness for people with, who have experienced chronic homelessness. There's lots of different types of supportive housing. Uh, it can be in an apartment building like Beacon does as a housing developer, and it can be a scattered site model, and you may hear from others today uh, who talk about the ability to deliver services to people who may be in, a, in the private rental market uh, with rent subsidy. I like to say we embrace this radical idea that different people need different things. And I appreciated the earlier comments that this does need to, in fact, be individualized and understanding that, uh, that a broad continuum of housing is really important, even within supportive housing. Mm -hmm. That scattered site will work well for some residents, and a single building where we build community and have a front desk will be important to the success of others. And having those kinds of choices built into our system is important. Supportive housing works for homeless young people coming out of um, homelessness, uh, which I believe Representative Husman may have been speaking of prior crossing uh, here in St. Paul. Uh, we've developed 125 homes here in the Twin Cities helping young people come out of homelessness and into stable homes with a lot of support services focused on education and employment. Um, we also have a lot of housing for single adults uh, that have, are experiencing uh, mental illness and uh, chemical dependency. Um, well, we believe in a wide range. We talk a lot about Housing First, which is that low barrier housing, and it's a very important part of our continuum, and we have some of our housing that is Housing First. We also have sober housing, so we think that that can also be an important part for people either in recovery or choosing to live in a sober environment. Uh, so we believe, once again, that people should be able to access different kinds of housing. And just recently, uh, just this uh, past winter, thanks to support from the state, uh, we were able to open Great River Landing, which is 72 homes for people coming out of incarceration. Uh, and so we have a lot of models of supportive housing that have been impactful. Um, I want to give just a real specific example. Many of you know about the encampment uh, where Native people were uh, experiencing uh, homelessness and, and really made both a, a, a community statement by choosing to be in an encampment together a year ago. Working with Avivo Mental Health Agency and Red Lake Nation, Beacon was able to successfully move 60 people out of the encampment or the navigation center into one of our supportive housing developments. And I'm happy to report that 80% of those individuals, many of whom had been previously homeless for many, many years and struggling with mental health and substance abuse, are still stably housed in our housing today. It's a remarkable success rate. 
It's also really important to lift up that supportive housing is cost effective. It, there is an extraordinary return on investment when we get people out of crisis and into a stable home. I often compare it to health care. If you go into an emergency room when you have a sore throat, it's much more expensive to get that care because the emergency room is set up to be able to help you in a heart attack. And that's how crisis centers are. They should, emergency shelters should be focused in helping people in that crisis moment. But long-term care is much more affordable in supportive housing. And in your packet is a research done by the Wilder Foundation about the return on investment on supportive housing. And that stu those studies have been replicated across the country. <coughs> So let me, um, uh, let me have John then share uh, his story that can really bring life uh, to the impact that supportive housing has on someone's life. Mr. Fritz, wel welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. I, uh, I'm John Fritz and I'm from a little tiny town up in northern Minnesota originally. And I become homeless the first time at 16. I was living in the park in my hometown. And uh, it never got better. I was... Uh, an alcoholic at that age. I had mental illness, undiagnosed. And uh, I just, I was chronically homeless for the next 34 years, 35 years. I, uh, I'd sober up, get on meds, quit taking my meds. Cause I, had, nobody was there to help to, to, to get me grounded. And I, um, I rode a freight train around the country. I wrote a book called Homeless is Not Hopeless. I put a plug in for my book. <laughs> it, um, I got to where I give up. I would literally given up on life. It, uh, I tried getting in and out of the treatment centers and jails. And I've been in jail in 16 states. Everywhere you go, when you're homeless, you're the threat to going to jail. And just because you're there, they'll find a reason to lock you up and find out things and try to get rid of you. And, uh, it's a chronic problem with the homeless. I mean, it's, uh, I lived outside because I could not function in, uh, in a shelter situation. So I, I camped out and <clears throat> I slept out in 27 Bowl. And there's people doing that every night. Uh, Thanks to uh, the state of Minnesota, I went to my 17th treatment. And I come out of treatment and I didn't have nowhere to go. So I went back to an old girlfriend's place. And they were smoking meth and drinking. And I struggled and I struggled and I struggled. And finally, I was able to, through American House, there was a lady working there. And through her, I was able to get on a GRH program that uh, housed me in American house. They give me some place I could call mine. <coughs> Excuse me. But I, uh, I, w I moved into American house and uh, I had a key to my door. It's been a long time since I had a key to a door. I was able to have some place I could sleep at night not worry. I had people there that I could go talk to. There was people on staff that I could go talk to and say, hey, I'm not feeling good today. And they were encouraging and helped me get, make sure I went to my appointments. Because I have uh, been seeing a therapist and psychiatrist now for 10 years. I've been clean for 10 years thanks to these programs. I'm a very blessed person. I got in on it early on the housing first. It um, just made a major impact. It, uh, I, the importance of having that place, because I could, like I say, I couldn't deal with being in a shelter. I couldn't deal being in halfway houses because I don't like people. Honestly, I don't like a lot of people. And I, it's really hard to function in, uh, when you got three, 300 people around you, like, the, like Dorothy Day has, or uh, housing for whatever they call it, greater, or what is it now? Higher ground. Higher <laughs> ground, there we go. <laughs> like higher ground, they got a lot of people there, and I, I just couldn't function in that kind of setting. So when I was able to move into my own place, I could start focusing on what I really needed to do. I didn't have to think about, what am I going to eat today? 
How am I going to stay warm tonight? Where am I going to find a pack of cigarettes? What, what, what can I do today other than wander around looking for things? I mean, when you can't find a job because you don't have no address. Don't have a telephone. And you, uh, some people don't want to talk to you. Where do you shower when you do get a job? Where do you shower at night time? There's so many obstacles trying to find a job and trying to find housing. I uh, have no housing history. Can you share where you are today? I just think people would Okay, be okay. Uh, today, I am on the board of directors of Open Your Heart and Homeless. <laughs> I um, have a job full time. i am got a pickup. First time I have had a vehicle of my name, and I'm 60 years old. I uh, live with a wonderful woman. It's uh, it's all due to the fact that I had some supportive housing. If I went to had that, I because I tried in and out, in and out of the halfway houses and that and it, to get me in my own home. I was blessed that I was able to move into an apartment building. I mean, it's uh. I've uh, stayed there for quite some time. It took me a long time just to learn how to function in society again. Because I really never was part of, of a society. And uh, it's real. To, to realize that I have come from sleeping under bridges to being on a board of directors of, uh, is, uh, is amazing. And it can be done. I'm proof that this stuff works. It's, um, I uh, hope that uh, we can keep funding this. Thank you. And and thanks, folks. Thank you, John. Um, I'm really grateful for John's willingness to come and just share so openly with you the impact, um, because I think it really brings life to the statistics that we often talk about. Um, and one of the things I think John wanted to share is that he's really proud that he's um, that the help was there when he needed it, um, but he's actually no longer on public assistance with the exception of his health care that he needs, obviously, to keep his stability. And so it really shows that ability to be able to move forward uh, and that how important that stability is. And as, as John's here to help testify, because we've said to him, you know, that what makes this possible is the funding that the state and other uh, entities make available in our community. And I want to share um, how important for Beacon housing infrastructure bonds have been. Um, and I know that this is a big year that bonding has talked about. Uh, and Beacon has been a part of advocating for this along with Homes for All since the very beginning and a lot of the leadership from uh, Chair Hausman and others uh, and we're really pleased of the bipartisan support that housing infrastructure bonds have had uh, and that that housing is being created all over the state and I will get you that statistic Representative Hornstein but I, I don't know um, uh, uh, other than the impact that I can speak about uh, for Beacon. Um, as the numbers of, uh, as housing infrastructure bonds has become a resource uh, that housing organizations like Beacon can count on, uh, it takes a couple of years to go through affordable housing development. Uh, so we really have to be able to start to count on that as an ongoing stream of resources to be able to go out and acquire a site, put the plans together, get them through City Hall, and be able to then have the resources to build them. And it does take both capital and rent subsidy and the supportive services funding to be able to create the ho homes that we, that we want. Uh, with housing infrastructure, uh, Beacon uh, is now close to creating over 300 homes specifically with housing infrastructure bonds, not counting all those that we've created with other resources. Um, and um, uh, the, the housing infrastructure bonds help leverage uh, other federal, county, local, and private resources to help make those happen. <coughs> I mentioned earlier the youth housing that we were able to develop it for. Uh, we've currently just been awarded uh, the opportunity to double Lydia Apartments, which is sober housing for people with a disability, to renovate American House, which is where John lived, uh, to be able to, uh, to birth it into the next uh, uh, decades of useful life, and then Bimo Seda, which is Ojibwe for Let's Walk Together, which will be a, natively, a native culturally specific housing created with Red Lake Nation and Avivo uh, in, in downtown Minneapolis to once again serve the, the chronically a homeless population that's disproportionately um, within the native community. But I also have to say that the need is not yet met, unfortunately. You've heard a lot about that today. We've made a commitment to double supportive housing, our ability just organizationally to be able to double supportive housing 
to be able to contribute to ending homelessness in our community. So we have another 150 homes under development in three locations, uh, in uh, Minneapolis, in suburban Hennepin, and in Scott County for supportive housing for families. And uh, following up on what Lee Stewart said, family uh, housing, supportive housing for families is actually the most difficult to find uh, because often those resources don't match up. Um, Oh, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, let me stop for that. Um, so, so just building uh, will cost those three housing developments, because they're large and they're family, will cost about $45 million to develop. One of the things we always do say, and I know it's sometimes sticker shock, that affordable housing should never be cheap housing. Affordable housing needs to be quality housing uh, that, has, uh, uh, that has affordable rents. Uh, and I think we learned from the 60s that it's a mistake to build cheap housing. Uh, it's part of what has created some stigma. We're really proud that people come in and try to buy condos from us in our supportive <laughs> housing um, because we fit into the community um, and we are then welcomed by our neighbors because of that. So we're here to, to support uh, Homes for All, call for $500 million for bonding. Um, and the governor's request for $260 million in bonding for housing infrastructure bonds. And I hope I ask you to support that ongoing investment in ending homelessness. Housing infrastructure bonds are a particularly important resource because they are targeted for those at the greatest need, for those who are 30% area median income, and in, in real speak, that's less than $25,000 a year. Our residents, when they move in, on average, have incomes of $5,000. So this is deeply affordable housing. And we do understand that the, the state may need a continue, uh, or that we do need a continuum of housing, uh, low income housing tax credits, which is another resource from the federal government for housing, uh, is often awarded for workforce housing. And so we think it's really important to keep housing infrastructure bonds targeted at 30% AMI or below. There's been some discussion about lifting that all the way up to 50%, and I would encourage you to help hold this particular resource uh, for supportive housing, particularly given that conversation today about the intersection for those uh, uh, in, in experiencing homelessness and mental illness. It allows not only that intersection, but the intersection with the criminal justice system and with the child welfare system. A part of what we see within family homelessness um, is our ability to do, provide the wraparound services for families uh, that have been engaged in the child welfare and child protection system. Our ability, if we have those kind of deep, comprehensive services where we can keep children safe but families together, uh, really can reform our system and once again, uh, really look at the equity issues that disproportionately impact African American and families and Native families who have their children removed. And so supportive housing can be a key resource and housing infrastructure bonds are part of the infrastructure that would allow organizations like Beacon across the state to respond to that need. I also want to speak that along with capital is the need for rent subsidy. Uh, housing supports GRH, uh, many of you may know on this committee already, group residential housing. Uh, it was really initially designed to help people in a board and lodge or group home setting. Uh, it's now, uh, lots of people have done work to allow it to be used in support of housing, more independent living. Um, and that's really revolutionized our ability to create the kind of housing uh, that John was the beneficiary of. But I do want to point out that housing support doesn't work for families. The subsidy, because we were, had such a mindset for group homes that you never had your children. So group homes for people with mental illness, your children have in fact been removed. And if we want to serve families, we have to change that resource. I do realize uh, that won't be in your committee, it'll be in the Department of Human Services, but because of the intersection, I wanted to lift it up for you. Um, that uh, the housing support provides a rent subsidy up to $922, and that doesn't help someone who needs a two, three, or four bedroom unit. So uh, we are uh, working with legislators uh, to create some opportunities to be able to family size housing support so we can create the family supportive housing uh, that, uh, that is so needed in our community. The other resource that we see that is so needed in the developments that we do is funding for front desk. Um, it is one of the things that allows us to really think about a housing first model, that we are able to bring people in who have um, uh, had more challenging rental histories and other landlords will not allow uh, to move into their housing. And so it allows us to reduce those barriers so we can bring people immediately into a home, but also know that particularly we can keep guests out. Uh, it's really one of the greatest uh, things that a front desk does is to be able to keep the 
tenants safe, guests out, uh, and then provide that crisis intervention in the in the evening uh, or overnight. Um, and I think both DHS and Minnesota Housing are work working to try to figure out how to complement those resources so that when we get capital dollars, we're also able to get the rent and supportive services dollars that we need to comprehensively create so supportive housing. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Uh, we really wanted to share this perspective on our experience and really want to thank you for being a partner with us in investing in housing in dignity for all of our residents. And thank you, Mr. Fritz, for sharing your story with us. We, um, uh, it's important for us to hear and, and we learn from it. We have a couple of questions. Representative Bierman. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Since I raised my hand, um, Ms. Blum, answered a bunch of the questions that I had, but I did want to follow up on one which relates to what you were just talking about with the um, ability to keep people in who maybe exceed the income level at a certain point. Are they, what's the time level that your typical resident might stay in the home or is there, is there one? Do you track that sort of data? Thank Ms. Bonds. <coughs> Committee, uh, excuse, excuse me. I don't do this often enough, at Chair Representative. Um, so the, so I was not actually speaking about the income level. So I was just talking about the rent subsidy that's available, and okay. that it wasn't enough rent subsidy. Um, but I can speak to your question just about tenure. So at Lydia Apartment, uh, which has been our longest uh, supportive housing, it's been open for over 15 years. We've had a number of residents who, the majority of our residents, have stayed about five years, um, and some of that stability is really important. Uh, in terms of the time it can take to recover from trauma and to get stabilized. Uh, and then we have about a 70 to 80 percent success rate in terms of people then being able to move out of supportive housing into other stable housing in the community. So we are able to track that. Um, but it rarely is it because people have exceeded the income levels. Um, it's really quite, um, uh, quite flexible and it would only be um, uh, in more workforce housing where you would tend to see income levels become an issue. Okay, Th th Perhaps thank you, Madam Chair, and um, just a uh, follow up to that. That that's exactly what I wanted to understand was the time, and then I I wanted to chime in also to Mr. Fritz. Thank you very much for coming in because your testimony of talking about your experience in such vivid detail, it's really important for us to hear about that. And uh, just want to thank you very much for coming in and sharing your story with us because. That's that's extremely important, and you think you know you meet homeless people and you talk about what they go through, and it's you you, you st realize quickly that it's not just the night when people are homeless and need shelter; it's the next day and the continuum of care and how long it can take. And you're a success story, so I applaud you and thanks for coming. Representative Jurgens. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Fritz. Congratulations on. 10 years of sobriety and congratulations on your home and your pickup and your job. My question for you is, in your case, which came first, sobriety or the home? Mr. Fritz. Um, I actually sobered up a little bit before I got a home. But it was a struggle that you wouldn't believe trying to maintain mental health, stay away from the drinking, and trying to find a place to live. There's no way I could go try to find a job or a place. I mean, nobody wanted to rent to me or anything, so where was I? I was ready to go back to drinking when I, I finally got housing. And was it Union Gospel that got you into church? I went to uh, the Union Gospel mission one night. I was, I was, uh, I was either killing myself or do something. I went to the Union Gospel mission and they talked me into going to the psych ward for the third time in a year. And it all just kind of fell into place after that. I mean, when I was ready to give up again, something would pop up. Like eating on his GRH program and getting into American houses. It was the major impact thing that kept me sober. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Senator Re Representative. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Otis Sander from Ujama Place. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. 
Madam Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Otis Zanders, and I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of Ujama Place. Ujama Place, and it's just a pleasure, first of all, to be invited to as the, one of the community partners to put a little volume on the issue of homelessness, chronic homelessness, and to talk about the role that Ujama play in that continuum of services. Ujama in place uh, served primarily young African-American men between the ages of 18 and 30. A lot of our population are trying to overcome historic and chronic problems that have led to a life of uh, in incarceration or just living on the fringes of society. We address the issue that we feel a lot of uh, prevention services as well as reentry services for young men that are trying to own their pathway to prosperity. Our overarching mission is to eliminate contact with the criminal justice system. And by doing so, we've uh, entrenched in evidence-based practices and program that we think are pathways into incarceration. Those are being um, unemployment, uh, lack of education, a lot of historical trauma in their lives, but more importantly is housing, the lack of housing, unstable housing. Approximately 100%, 99 to 100% of our men that we meet with are in, uh, they are homeless or they're in unstable housing. They're in housing that they're depending on friends from day to day, they're doing uh, couch surfing, they're in basements of their mother's and aunt's house that, um, that are putting them in jeopardy of their home. So the men we work with to make our theory of transformation work is totally dependent on them trying to stabilize their lives through housing. Quickly learning that no one can concentrate on getting their GED if they don't have a stable home or can concentrate on finding employment when there's no address, what have you, or to address all of the chronic illnesses that goes with being homeless. So again, our organization deal with that inner path that you heard about of uh, mental health issues and poverty. In doing so, we had a lot of our partners that you heard from today, from Catholic Charities, um, Beacon, and also friends in the audience from Community Stabilization Project, uh, God's Permission, and a host of landlords that's willing to to, uh, to provide housing for a lot of the men that we try to prepare for. But in doing so, we're dealing with a tremendous nexus of trying to deal totally with restoration. Prior to my time at Ujama Place, I worked for 34 years with the Minnesota Department of Corrections. During my tenure, I had a front door, front seat to trying to work with you, the legislative bodies, to address the, uh, the mass incarceration, the number of men that was coming into the system. And during that time to address a lot of intake, a lot of growth, we closed several state hospitals and we converted those state hospitals into correctional facilities. By converting those state hospitals into correctional facilities, a lot of resources didn't come. So you left the problem of mental illness, codependencies, you left it to the burden of a community without a lot of resources. Uh, that burden that led to those facilities, again, it's left a part that we have dealt with people that were suffering from chronic mental illness, chronic homelessness, and the, and the receptacle was the correctional facilities. And so our work that we are doing with Ujama is use that partner to address that systemic problem, the issue we have of people trying to return or prevent themselves from going into the prison system, and the ones that's coming out are the same things. I think we agree that, that the issues that lead a person into incarceration are the same issue they face when they're coming out. And to, uh, again, to get over the stigma of being an ex-felon, but to find organizations, the ones that I mentioned that you're hearing testimony to, that's willing, they're willing to understand this an issue for them to get stabilization. The picture of second chances here. The partners we work with understand that working with mental illness is sometimes uh, a benefit of, uh, a side effect, should I say, of our homelessness, not having resources, not having the ability to fend for yourselves. So the program like we serve is trying is a prep. We prepare people for society, but that cannot be done without having a stable home. It cannot be done unless we, not just a stable home, but affordable homes. And to look at the kind of situation we have now with the property, as we prepare people to be homeowners, you got to understand that we understand, we got to understand with the employment community and address the problem having things that are affordable. We look at how we look in certain communities and we through change the value of them by changing the profile of the people that historically live there. We look at building as we do in um, community restabilization, we tear down homes that could be remodeled for affordable living. 
And so anything that this committee can address in terms of supporting the bonding to address additional homes, additional programs that support homelessness is tremendously important to the work we get done. And the partnership that we have that we find out that once a person gets stable, we see in evidence, we see in product that we can show you that uh, we see in people connect with their families. We see in restorations of families. We see in men go out and, and fight for custody of their kids once they get stable housing. We see in stable housing put people in the community where we know that when you're dealing with chronic homelessness, there's a tremendous amount of health problem that goes with that. We have known that person that live in a chronic and homelessness, their life expectancy is short. We see in the birth of defects. We see in infant mortality is being affected by this health issue here. We see in the lack of, we're saying that we're eating healthy when you're finding out that you're eating from various degrees of fast food or in communities that don't have healthy opportunities for you. So we've seen the quality of schools get affected. A person's social network, as we know, it get affected by all of this. So when we talk about the issue that we're trying to prepare for, Ujamaa itself depends on our partners in order for us to go ahead and establish things that maybe we refer to as co-occurring. We all know story that when you're talking about the mental health and talking about the masking that take place with uh, illegal drugs, what have you. But it goes back to the point that we hear, and it is a pleasure for me today to bring volume to the issue that you've been hearing from before and after me, just how this intersection of trying to uplift people out of poverty so they can afford their own homes, uh, addressing the, the, the wage inequity, the social and economic value of it, and also that you can't think about the population we work with, whether they're coming out of incarceration or just like chronically on the streets, it's just the, uh, just the living in the survival mode that puts you in jeopardy, the stigma it has of trying to get your, your feet grounded, what have you. So again, it's just a pleasure for me and Ujama Place to have a voice at this table to uh, present to some and introduce to others the ability of going out and being entrenched in a program that's, that's designed to have the pillars for prosperity to take place and to address chronic homelessness and most of all, to make our most vulnerable, the ones that we refer to as the least of these, an opportunity to have prosperity and we would not be a burden to taxpayers in this state. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Great. We're joined next by Jean Lee from, the Ch from Children's Hope International. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Yes, Madam Chair, members, thank you. I'm Reverend Dr. Jean Lee, um, President and Executive Director of Children's Hope International, which does legal advocacy and policy uh, since the 1980s. R and R family centers are, are shelters, transitional, and permanent housing and services in the areas of housing, health, and human services, legal, and victim services. Um, especially in domestic violence and sexual assault uh, since the 1970s. And APAC is our housing consortium made of members, some you've already heard in a past testimony. Um, I'm going to pre preface my testimony and ask you to excuse me because I haven't slept for two days. <laughs> So I might make mistakes and go and, off. And script. you have prepared it, so right, we, but, we, we have it before us. Right, but there are some additional comments I would like to make on top of that. And um, as the others were telling their stories, I wanted, and focusing on shelters and housing, I just wanted to say that um, I was a victim of domestic abuse, where, um, and that's how I started our shelters, where the only place we this way, I know. We had at the time to go is to sleep in the car in a parking lot or by a police station for safety. So um, in one of the instances, some nuns took me in and they had a private shelter and they kind of helped me along as far as starting uh, our work and doing shelters. So um, we've continued the work for a long time, adding services as we could. Um, but we have also tried to um, deal with the issues as far as the system systemic issues that cause or contributed to some of the problems. And that's why I'm still doing legislative work. Um, 
One of the things that I wanted to mention is when you talk of mental health, there are two uh, theories on that or two aspects of that. One is the behavioral mental health, which they say can be done by changes in behavior, counseling, and that type of thing. Um, the other type is what they call the physical or genetics end of things. And in that respect, um, we made some changes in the 1990s, and I had the help of uh, Senator uh, Paul Wellstone and his wife Sheila, they took it up to President Clinton and Vice President Gore to make changes at the national level because we had problems trying to get systemic change at the state level. And what they did is they focused it on the medical evidence model as far as treating the brain like an organ and, and mapping it out, finding out what functions were uh, affecting what areas and how they could treat it and cure it. So um, in that respect, there are some what some people might call mental health issues that are really uh, treatable as far as uh, physically and through science. Um, Mayo and Medtronic, we worked with them as far as developing some of the innovations in that area where, for example, they use deep brain stimulation. Um, but there's also gaps in the need. And this is why we support what we call medical technology, because there are still things that can be helped that they haven't delved into. And uh, we encourage you know, people as they're looking at mental health issues to think about what can be done there. Um, as I said, uh, mental health is also affected by genetics, food, chemicals, environment, housing, and people's, other people, circumstances, and injury. So when I was assaulted and almost killed, I had a head injury. But that did not affect my mental health in a sense of how other people think of mental health. It's an injury. And so it's been treated as such. Um, but I would like to say along that line is a factor that I, as I learn more about the medical sciences um, is what stress causes because a lot of the people who are having what some see as mental health issues are undergoing a tremendous amount of stress. Stress affects a person's blood pressure and when their blood pressure goes up above a certain level, then they start having all kinds of problems which can further damage the brain, the heart, the kidneys, cause um, problems with their blood vessels, and it has contributed to stroke, heart attacks, diabetes, and other things that are costly in the health field. So to the extent we can uh, help people reduce some of those factors, um, that would also uh, go a long way. Um, and that may not necessarily tie to the issue as far as how housing affects them, but um, a lack of housing will definitely affect them and uh, up their stress. Um, we do a lot with seniors. We have many senior cases and we have cases where uh, people with stroke, they have trouble talking and communicating. Um, this is why um, we support, again, the medical technologies because it's not out there even with some of the, I think Mayo's the only one who has come the furthest as far as helping in that area. And so um, we also encourage more support and training as far as uh, mental health in that area. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of these things. What I suggested was the, as far... The wonderful thing is you yeah. you have written it all down for us, and so we, we uh, have it in front of us and won't need to remember the words because it's okay. all here, so I think it's, it's very clear. Okay, so basically I just wanted to say that um, we did ask for certain things which are different from what the others were asking for. We asked for 
su more support in the different forms of education and accountability. And the other thing we also feel there's a need for that's impacting people's mental health is how the judiciary and other professionals are interacting with these people, causing more problems, exasperate, exasperating their uh, conditions in their housing and so forth. So we even have to the extent um, a code enforcement officer who's trying to get a person of color out of their home because he wants the home. So they're making up all kinds of things that's wrong with the home and the only way to fight it is going through the court system. But this is having a terrible toll on the person's mental health, uh, their, their stress factor and causing other health problems. So um, we asked for some changes there as far as uh, changing some of the existing laws. There's a section in the Revenue Department law that affects, that is a pro problematic. And also we talk about how you can save costs and by doing different things. So we ask you to take a look at that and thank you for your Good. time. Thank you very much. And we're joined now by Sue Watloff Phillips from MICA, Metropolitan Interfaith Council on Affordable Housing. I started my day with them at a... <laughs> Representative Bierman said he went uh, as well to his, I think you ha had yours in your, uh, the mic of breakfast. And Representative Juergens. Well. And Representative Juergens, so yesterday. And um, Madam Chair, Representative Fisher also joined us um, in our Northeast chapter um, meeting um, and uh, Representative Her was also there too. So good afternoon. Um, again, Madam Chair of Representatives, I was here last um, week. Sue Watlow Phillips, Executive Director of MICA, and I will give you some of the other titles in a minute, but I w I'm here because um, I have a dual diagnosis of depression and also of um, alcoholism. And um, um, I've worked in the field of homelessness and housing uh, for 52 years. And as I have worked in this field and see, have, uh, have seen people die from homelessness, I turned more and more to alcohol to get away from that pain. Um, after about 25 years of drinking, it turned into a disease called alcoholism. Um, the, being in the wealthiest nation in the country, having people that are experiencing homelessness and this growth of homelessness that we've had over the last four decades is just not acceptable. As a person of faith, I truly believe that how we treat those with the least is how we treat our God. And I think it's important that we remember that. So I struggled for 10 years with alcoholism in the early 2000s, had two outpatient um, treatments, uh, had three years of sobriety, another year and a half of sobriety. In 2011, trying to stay sober, I exercised, which I um, have done throughout my life and trained for the Olympics in the or, uh, late 60s and early 70s. And I was prescribed um, a non-narcotic medication. Supposedly, that's what it was. It actually was an opioid, reclassified two years later. I had a stroke, a seizure, and my alcoholism went into a full rage. And I don't remember a couple months of 2011. I had a car accident, I hurt people, and I faced four years in prison. I went to Hazleton in January 2012 for 70 days, went to outpatient treatment, and I was convicted of a felony, was on probation for six years. I've now been sober for eight years. I would have been homeless if I did not have the resources to pay for treatment and to um, and own my own home. I, couldn't, I cannot rent a place in, in the state of Minnesota because of my felony. If you have resources, and issues, you'll be able to buy a home. If you're limited with no resources and issues like mine, you'll probably be homeless um, because in our current rental market with the background checks and needing two to three times the amount of income, you can't make it. So in addition to having a dual diagnosis, I'm vice president of the National Coalition for the Homeless. I own a couple of for-profit businesses. I'm a retired psychologist, independent clinical social worker, and marriage and family therapist. So let me tell you why we are in this mess as far as the mental health area and people experiencing homelessness besides my personal experience. I wanted to tell you that because I wanted you to understand that if you have money and you have these issues, you can be housed. But if you don't have money or you have very limited money and you have these issues, you can't get into housing. So half of the American population, and some of these things are in handouts that you have, according to the CDC, will have a mental health issue in, in your lifetime. So half of us in this room will have a mental health issue. Not half of us in this room are homeless right now. Many people will self-medicate with alcohol or other drugs 
because the side effects of the drugs that we created in the 50s and 60s, which was a part of the reason that we began the deinstitutionalization process, have incredible side effects. And people won't take the medication because of those side effects. So they'll use alcohol and other drugs. So when we de decided to do the institutionalization in the 50s and 60s and signed into law by President Kennedy, what the, the whole thought is, we're gonna save $100,000 a year by having people move into the community. But we never created those community settings for folks. Where a lot of folks moved were into our downtown areas, into what we called the residential hotels. And then in urban renewal, we bulldozed those and we did not replace those. So in the early 80s, this is when we really began to see the growth of individuals that are homeless and shelters opening up in church-based church shelters. So for us, as we're moving ahead, supportive housing is an incredibly important part of the continuum to housing, but we really need to take a look at the entire an integrated system that's addressing the mental health folk of issues of folks in whatever housing and preventing people from becoming homeless and then if they are becoming homeless, getting them back into housing as quickly as possible. Um, so one of the things, and we say this a lot from Micah because half of our board have experienced homelessness and 70% of our board um, have uh, been um, impacted by the um, housing, housing crisis and our diverse populations, is that we need to listen to people that are impacted and have them as, as decision makers at every table. Let them design and develop and implement the housing opportunities. Let them work in the programs. Do the peer-to-peer -peer type of, of counseling. So we can begin some of the work in some of our drop-in centers and even a little bit outside by developing that trust so people actually do want to come into the system. But that will happen with people that they know and trust. It's not going to happen by necessarily a psychologist. And you know, if you take a look at the literature, the most successful um, counselors are really the peer-to-peer -peer counseling. And even though I carry, have carried many degrees and many licenses in my lifetime, and I appreciate all that great training that I have, is that really that peer-to-peer -peer counseling and people like uh, what we have in regards to freedom from the streets can really help people. So Micah's, um, again, 70% uh, of our board are people that um, have had housing issues and diverse population, half have experienced homelessness. Two of our, our board members currently sit on Homes for All, so they're really helping to design some of the legislation that's coming forward. So while we heard from um, Lee Baum that, we, that uh, she would not necessarily support the ho um, housing infrastructure bonds going to 50% of median income, our focus really is at that 30% and below, but also to have some of that housing without support services. So people can move out of supportive housing into housing. Because the reason that people are staying in for five years or 10 or 15 years in some cases in our supportive housing program, which is a very expensive model, um, not compared to other models, but it is an expensive model, is because there's no housing for people to move into and then use the supports within the community. So we need to fund solutions like Envision the Tiny Homes, cooperatives, manufactured homes, SROs, community organizing work, a wide variety of housing options for people, and then have the flexible system because people in their mental health um, situations um, sometimes they're doing really well, sometimes they're not doing really well. And so we need to have that flexibility <coughs> to deal with that. So our work at MICA is based on solutions that come from and are developed by the diverse people impacted in the community. By listening, we think that we really create those opportunities. So we encourage you as you look at the housing infrastructure bonds and what we're suggesting from Homes for All is that you really look at um, the opportunity for us to help people move out of supportive housing into affordable housing. And then also as we look at the lead safe home bill is that people become brain damaged because of lead paint. This creates ongoing disability for them for the rest of their life. Traumatic brain injury also. So as talked about earlier, we have a large number of people that are in our, our prison system today because they have mental health, brain damage, and that's both from traumatic brain injury and lead poisoning. And we're having a hard time getting them placed in housing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. The next two, uh, Ann McInerney and Claire Jordan, are both from the St. Paul Public Schools. It looks like they are coming down together, I think, right? Good. Welcome to the committee. And uh, Ms. McInerney, are you going first? I am, yes. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome thank to the you, committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Ann McInerney, and I'm the McKinney-Vento liaison for St. Paul Public Schools. 
Uh, if, in case you don't know, a brief overview of McKinney-Vento's federal law states that every public school, including charter schools, must have an appointed, appointed liaison. So every single public school has someone like me that is working on um, identifying and assisting families and youth students that are experiencing homelessness. Part of our job is to connect families and youth to local shelters, homeless resources, collaborate with the local continuums of care, and identify all of the students that are experiencing homelessness. We also must offer transportation so that school stability can be maintained regardless of where the family and the students are living. So for example, right now in St. Paul schools, we're providing transportation out to Brooklyn Center, to Fridley, to Red Wing, so that students can continue to stay in their current school. Um, we also must offer immediate enrollment into school, even if people do not have their transcripts and immunization records, any other kind of documentation, because what we know is that if you are experiencing homelessness and you're moving around quite a bit, it's difficult to keep track of all of those documents. Um, we also, you automatically um, enroll in f to get free meals, and then we try to really connect families and youth with the local services in our area. A couple of the points that I would like to make um, as you're looking through all the papers, and I appreciate all of the other speakers that came up today to share some of the information about the Wilder study and a little bit about the point in time count. Um, one of the caveats to that is that under McKinney Ventral Federal Law for School Districts, we can count students and families that are doubled up. So we have now um, looked at research and they, we are determining that many of the students that are identified, there's at least 75% of students in our public schools that are considered doubled up, mm -hmm. meaning that they're not in shelters. And so when we look at the point in time count, that point in time count is only looking at um, people that are in shelters or who are physically unsheltered, so staying outside, but that does not include anybody that is doubled up. So when we look at those numbers, they're stark, but we also have to realize that we have to multiply by quite a bit after that. The Wilder study as well is fantastic. It's so comprehensive. It gives us a lot of really great information. But what we um, have found is that it really does rely on the volunteers and staff and families and, and people to complete the survey. It takes an, a couple of minutes, at least 45 to an hour. Um, it asks a lot of really um, intrusive questions. And again, it's really good information, but a lot of people are not going to complete that survey. So for example, um, there was federal um, data stating that there were at least 16,000 students that were identified as experiencing homelessness in, the 20, in 2016. So if we look at the 16,000 just students compared to the um, numbers that come up through Pitt, for the, through the Pitt count and even just our local um, Wilder study, it is very different. So I wanted just to point those two things out. Um, across uh, Minnesota, like I said, there's about 16,000 students that are ex experiencing homelessness. Um, just to drill down a little bit farther, we have looked at that across the U.S., children with disabilities compromise the largest subgroup with about 18%. Reading proficiency for the students is about 30%. Math proficiency is about 25%. So the um, impact of experiencing homelessness really does affect proficiency rates, attendance, how often students are getting to school, and how much they're connecting and able to um, progress educationally. Um, to drill down into St. Paul schools, we have identified about, about 2,000 students every year as experiencing homelessness. 65% of those are doubled up with others. 65% are students of color. Um, there are children experiencing homelessness in every area in the state of Minnesota. It might look different across the state where because of lack of shelter, there is more shelter in the metro area or higher population areas. But we know that um, lack of shelter only leads people to having to double up with others in sometimes often unsafe situations. We heard about that earlier. We have families that are then forced to stay in storage units that have to stay in their car or in fish houses. We have heard all of these examples across the state, and even though it looks really different, um, you need to know that in every place in Minnesota there are students that are experiencing homelessness. Families lose their housing for many reasons. If a child is sick and a parent, and a parent has to miss work, um, they will miss getting paid and could fall behind on their rent or paying for other services. 
Um, if an apartment building is sold or the rent increases, if a landlord decides to raise the rent, family and children can be evicted and then are forced to rely on a already over full system to help them find housing. Lack of affordable housing has been in a crisis level for a long time. Multiple applications, multiple applica application fees, discrimination, long wait lists to get into subsidized housing, uh, keep people out for the rental market and force them to turn to shelter. For example, landlords, including those accepting Section 8, are now asking for first month's rent, last month's rent, and a security deposit. So for anyone on a fixed income, um, coming up with three times a rent is going to be impossible. Whether students are living doubled up or with others or live in a shelter, the stress can be difficult. Stress about housing, food insecurity, safety, transportation, inadequate housing, medical care, mental health care, all factor into the well, overall well-being. If a parent is struggling with their mental health, and they need to refill their medication, for example, but they need to use public transportation and they have to get there during the course of a school day so that they are home when the child gets home or during the school hours, can, and not, plus also having to pay a copay, it's likely that they will not make that appointment. Um, filling out MFIP renewal applications, receiving benefit cards, meeting with community resources, all that is much more difficult without reliable transportation and a stable home or address. Where can you have a benefit card sent if you are doubled up with someone different every week? How do you apply for a job without a permanent address? How does your child get to school when you move several times a week? This is, these are some of the issues that we see on a daily basis. We often have to change transportation for a student because they're having to move so often and oftentimes we're missing them. So then they are not coming to school um, because we can't get a bus set up quick enough. If a parent or child has mild depression, anxiety, or behavior issues before becoming homeless, the symptoms may only increase due to the stress of homelessness. Trauma, substance use, mental health issues, behavior issues can increase when your family is forced to live in their car because the shelters are full. Food insecurity, safety concerns, financial strains only exasperate even the most mild of symptoms. Through our experience in St. Paul schools, we have seen families turn down and offer to sleep on the church basement floors because they could not handle sleeping with 20 other people in one big room. They have chosen to sleep in their car or a storage unit because they know it will be better for the mental health. We are so grateful for Interfaith Action and the church volunteers to offer their churches, but we also know that they are facing difficulty with meeting the mental health needs of those families and students. I appreciate your time today and we appreciate your interest in homelessness and the effect on our um, youngest population and mental health. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jordan. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for having this important hearing today and the opportunity to share one story that is typical in my work as a St. Paul School social worker. I have to say today I feel like I'm in a time warp when I listen to the testimony I'm reminded of having managed shelter and transitional housing for family 30 years ago when the stories were similar in Louisville, Kentucky, and 3,000 children were homeless every year. Today, I will shine a light on one family whose story illustrates some of the testimony that you've heard today. I serve families with children under three, under the age of three, who qualify for special education. This family's circumstances are unfortunately not unusual. Both parents have severe and persistent mental illness and each had work history prior to homelessness. Our multidisciplinary team began serving them when the child was a year old. Having come from living in a camper without electricity, they were doubled up in an apartment with a mentally ill acquaintance, jeopardizing the lease for this host. The host insisted that, insisted that the toddler not tantrum. The noise was bothersome, so both parents constantly scolded him for crying. They were asked to leave, and after a waiting period, they entered the family shelter in Maplewood. An, an adult rehabilitative mental health service worker, or arms worker, teamed with us there to assist the family. At the family shelter, the parents spent most days outside in the parking lot in the hot sun with their child. Per the special education plan, they were trying to work on feeding concerns as the child was quite frail. They used his stroller as a high chair and fed him whatever foods they ate, 
often pop and chips and fruit. They were uncomfortable in the cafeteria because their child could not remain seated to eat and other families objected to him approaching their tables. Also, the foods that the doctor had recommended were often not available for the child. At night, they were written up for the noise that their boy made when he screamed. He was unable to use words to meet his needs. Most days, dad spent hours walking. Due to paranoia and previous exposure to violence, he did not like to be around groups. Mom struggled with depression and anxiety, exacerbated by the uncertainty of future housing. Both began to show an increase in nonviolent mental Ill uh, symptoms of mental illness. He spoke in metaphors. She couldn't sleep. The plan was to apply for supportive housing, and the paperwork required, required to do so was substantial. Once they submitted the application, the family learned that they would be placed in a waiting pool of 300 families seeking supportive housing in Ramsey County. When the 90-day maximum stay in shelter was reached, the family had to exit and went to live in their non-working car in a parking lot of a friend's apartment. There they filled, feared child protection involvement, but found reassurance that per the county, homelessness is not considered a child protection issue. It was fall, but not cold enough to risk frostbite. They piled clothes and blankets on to sleep. After weeks, they were admitted to family place. This meant that at night they slept in church basements. The boy was not talking at age two. Their physical and dental health suffered. Living in shared quarters was exhausting and the family was cited for not providing constant supervision when their toddler ran around the family place. With no hop housing options in sight, they contacted an old friend who agreed to let them pay rent and live temporarily in his basement. The new place offered an opportunity for routines for the child and a reprieve from living in shelter. At first it was good, then tensions surfaced. The child, unable to talk, displayed higher frustration and anxiety. During this 18 months of homelessness and seven moves, the family lost most of their belongings as their storage unit was no longer affordable. A grandfather died, and with this their hopes of returning to the camper with no electricity. Several homeless friends died. After, after missed mental health appointments, dad's case was closed at the clinic. When the child turned three, we could no longer serve them by virtue of special education rulings. No permanent housing had been found. The family split up. Mental health care is available in our community. Homelessness is the greatest access barrier. We need long-term supportive housing if we want to prevent stories like this. People with serious mental illness, including my son, need this housing to achieve the mental and physical well-being required to work and have productive family lives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate having you here today. And we have one more uh, person on our agenda, Sam. Oh, no, we have there. I guess there are three people from NAMI. Is that right? Uh, and we'll pull another chair up to the table so all three of you can be at the table. And Mr. Smith, are you going first? Welcome to the committee. Oh my gosh. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sam Smith and I'm the Public Policy Coordinator with NAMI Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to address you all today about the challenges people with mental illnesses experience and they're trying to find and secure stable housing. I'm gonna compress this a bit because I know we're crunched for time. So I think the one thing I would add beyond what others have said today is that oftentimes people enter homelessness because of failures in other part of our system, whether it's uncoordinated health care, an encounter with the criminal justice system, and more often than not, this committee is left to pick up the pieces. And so for many of these folks who often face a myriad of challenges in their mental and physical health, it's often not enough to simply provide someone with a room to stay in. One very successful program to address these needs is permanent supportive housing. And with that, I'd like to turn to our first testifier. 
and that is thank you madam chair and members of the committee um, I'm very grateful to be here today to be able to speak on permanent supportive housing my name is Angela Crayer Hennen and welcome I'm with, to the committee thank you and I'm with um, I'm a program manager of supportive housing and outreach services at Guild Incorporated um, Guild Incorporated is a nonprofit in the metropolitan area helping people lead quality of lives by providing integrated treatment and services. I'm here just to talk about a few of the services that Guild Incorporated uh, provides to people in the supported uh, housing services and then also for those that are impacted with mental illness. I have brought with me today Gina Adams, um, one of our participants that has uh, worked with us in a couple of our different programs um, to tell her story. So one of Guild Incorporated's long, longest running supportive housing services is Delancey Street. Uh, it started in 2003. Delancey Street is a mobile team that provides flexible services, including intensive case management to support people with histories of long-term homelessness to establish and maintain housing while improving their quality of life. One of the other apartment complexes that were established in 2009 was created in collaboration with Project for Pride and Living and the St. Paul Public Housing Authority, providing 13 site-based subsidized units uh, to those in, that are experiencing chronic and long-term homelessness that in addition to that um, needed access to um, additional services such as nursing and employment and that we're also um, dealing with serious mental illness or serious and persistent mental illness. Um, our, housing access, our, our housing access resource team helps people with serious mental illness and experiencing either long-term homelessness, imminent risk of homelessness, or those exiting institutions to find and maintain housing by, by providing them with transition and tenancy sustaining services. One of the team's biggest roles is engaging landlords and cultivating ongoing relationships with them to connect prospective tenants. Um, Guild Incorporated's Coming Home program established in 2017 works with individuals being discharged from the mental health unit at St. Joseph's Hospital to help them secure housing. Those enrolled in the program um, will receive a housing subsidy paid through a grant with Hearth Connection. Our newest partnership in, in 2019, we collaborated with Hearth Connection and Dakota County to create the Dakota County Housing Search and Stability Services at Guild Incorporated. Utilizing HUD Continuum of Care and Emergency Solutions Grant, Rapid Rehousing assists individuals and families with short-term tenant-based rental assistance with or without disabilities move as quickly as possible into permanent housing and achieve stability in that housing. All of these services target individuals with the greatest number of barriers. Those who have chronic and long-term homelessness, serious persistent mental illness, and experiencing other social complexities like the lack of employment, poverty, trauma, and often legal barriers that prevent them from finding and keeping stable housing. All of these programs, whether it's with Guild Incorporated or other agencies, offer integrated, coordinated services to individuals supporting them to get them off the streets, find and keep permanent supportive housing, identify available resources to meet any needs for food, clothing, personal items, and also access care for physical, mental health, and chemical health needs. Also in exploring and pursuing work, school or volunteer opportunities and learn social and mediation skills needed to work with their landlords, get along with neighbors, and to develop and maintain positive relationships. In 2018, 367 adults ages 20 to 87 were served through these programs within Guild Incorporated with 333, 90.7% being placed in permanent supportive housing or maintaining permanent supportive housing. 100% of these individuals are leave, living with a significant mental illness and or a disabling condition. 75% of those individuals had verified serious and persistent mental illness. Using a housing first approach, these services assisted participants in establishing, maintaining housing 
improving their house, health and quality of life. As a provider of permanent supportive housing to those struggling with mental illness and homelessness, these programs have been crucial in helping individuals we serve. I thank you for your time, and then I will let Gina Adams tell you about her personal story. Ms. Adams, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair. And you'll pull the mic. Oh, pull the mic. <laughs> Sorry. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Gina Adams. I would have been my current apartment in Dakota County for about a year. I would like to share my story how Guild Incorporated and their permanent housing supportive, supportive housing services was able to get my daughter and me a place to live, <clears throat> to call home, and to continue to help me maintain my stability in life. Being homeless, you lose everything, your photo albums, your antiques, your clean clothes, everything that you need. I have depression, anxiety, borderline personality, personality disorder. Dealing with these on a daily basis of being homeless, I lost my job and I still had a family to support. <clears throat> it was the day before Christmas Eve, 2018. My daughter and I were staying in my car in a parking lot at Caribou Coffee. The police came up and were talking to us and I kind of got smart with them because I haven't done anything wrong and I haven't had good experiences in the past you know, with law enforcement and being homeless. We were just trying to find a place to stay. The next day, the officer, Kate McCarty, who had seen us the night before, he came and was very friendly, reassuring that he wasn't there to do us any harm. He was there actually to help us, which you don't always hear too often. The officer brought us to um, a party room. He had they, a team of people, they contacted them and they were able to get us a place to stay that night because there was no shelters available for us to go to. Um, they were kind enough to let us stay in the party room. That was the first day Christmas Eve that changed our whole lives and the, sorry. Can you finish her? Okay. One, one, act I'm of, sorry. one act of kindness. I'm sorry, yes. Um, they, we didn't even have food, simple living supplies to even eat or clean towels to shower. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Guild st the staff had brought us food. Um, supplies, I mean, everything um, to maintain, you know, to get us through for a few days and were very kind and checked on us. Um, I hadn't really ever experienced that kind of kindness in my life. Um, I just want to say that being housed and I have secured a job and I've been back working for several months now. My daughter, she calls them our team of angels. It's a team of people that came together to do everything to give us um, permanent housing and for us to continue getting services for our mental health. And I would just like to say thank you and that um, permanent housing does work um, for people and to get them and have their lives a better place. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yes, yeah, so we're happy to answer any questions the group has. Our, some of our legislative priorities that help support this mm -hmm. are in the fact sheet we sent around, whether it's questions for me or the rest of our team. Well, I was struck by the, the uh, one similarity between Mr. Fritz's story and Ms. Ms. Adams' story, and that is uh, they did both end with hope. We, we, uh, they were hard stories for us to hear, but they both ended with hope, um, and you both talked about you have a job, and uh, uh, we are very grateful for your willingness to come and, and share your. Well, Madam Chair, I'm very, in the committee, I'm very grateful for everything that. Representative Hassan does. has a question. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very powerful story to share, and it echoes on the importance of these are human lives, these are people, that it, those stories humanize. Um, the face of homelessness. So thank you for coming to share your story with us. And I think that um, listening to, to these stories and, and um, the hearing today, um, it puts, sheds a light on this is a problem that if we put resources on it and be intentional about it, that we can actually solve. It's a crisis, but it's a crisis that we can solve. So thank you. And Thank you. What I was struck by, as as all of these people on on our agenda told um, of their their work, 
Um, the nonprofits that we are uh, fortunate to have are all, I mean, they are, are such um, big contributors to, to that, uh, that possible solution. So thank you very much for your testimony. We have run over a bit, members. Um, the reason we had these two hearings is just to give you a sense of, of the session schedule. Uh, we only meet once a week, and uh, the committee deadlines uh, are out. They are very short. And our very first week, we lose our hearing because it's the Wednesday that we go to the university. So we have exactly four meetings. And um, I think Representative Howard himself has six or seven bills. So uh, we have, uh, I mean, the, the issues are so big and varied um, that a number of these um, advocacy groups have, bought, have brought uh, agendas to us. They are solutions, as Representative Hassan mentioned. So we will have to be very quick. Did you, did you, Representative Just I have a quick you? question. First of all, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I agree with Representative Hassan. This was important and powerful, and I, I really appreciate your organizing this. My question is, um, are, you, are we going to be hearing uh, any of the housing bonding bills uh, in this committee? I know sometimes in transportation mm -hmm. we hear the bills, even though they're not in the committee, kind of on an informational basis. The Homes for All bill, which has their whole agenda in, it has the 500 million bonding, but it also has policy in it. Mm -hmm. So it will have to come through this committee Great. first before it goes to um, the Capital Investment Committee. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. And I see no other questions. We are adjourned. <laughs>